Rick Miller, thank you for joining us here on the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. It's so great to have you here on the show. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Hi, Rick, and I'm here too. Uh, I was really pleased to see you again because uh, uh, I haven't seen you in ages and I, and I miss you. Well, we have an incredible connection, you and I, and I'm thrilled to be part of this. Oh, that's well, lovely. So, uh, so, guys, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about the connection and maybe we can get some background um, of uh, where Rick has come from. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I certainly uh, Rick's been invited, uh, besides the fact that I've known him for many years through the Milton Erickson Foundation. Um, we've, uh, I, I just attended a, a conference a couple of years, a year ago, whenever, whenever we were allowed to travel last. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, uh, uh, just Rick's presentation was so enormous. I've written about it at the Ericsson newsletter. Yeah. It was probably the best thing at the conference and should be at the evolution of psychotherapy because I think that's what he's doing. So anyway, that's all. Okay. So I got all excited and said to Rick, let's do it. It took a while we got in here. So it might be an idea, Rick, just to give a, a bit of a background of, of sure. the fascinating area you work in yeah. uh, and, and also uh, the couple of the books you're doing. We'll, we'll yeah. have those in the show mm -hmm. notes and just get yeah. it into the why don't I give you the 30 second or 45 second version of who I am? Ah, uh, the elevator That's speech. Good. Yes. The elevator speech, right. So I'm a psychotherapist and I'm located in Boston and Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And I'm a gay male um, and I'm out as a gay male therapist. And though it's not the only work that I do, I've found my niche in training mental health practitioners and medical doctors about working with gay men and I talk about the nuances of growing up gay, um, how providers can best treat their gay male clients, and we can go into greater detail with that. And I've written a couple of books, uh, which are for clinicians. One is called Unwrapped, Inter Integrative Therapy with Gay Men. And the other one is called Mindfulness Tools for Gay Men in Therapy, a Clinician's Guide. Um, so as Richard said, I do a lot of teaching as well. And about two years ago, I started a project called Gay Sons and Mothers. And I'm looking at the emotional relationship between gay men and their mothers um, through videos and photos. It's a creative, exciting, energetic look at these relationships. And that's me in a nutshell. Oh, I, I, it's, it's beautiful, and the the uh, the gay sons and mothers uh, video programs were, were were the central focus of of the presentation we were at. And I yeah. tell you what, there were there were many tears rolling down people's cheeks, <laughs> and not one box of Kleenex in the room, and not one box of Kleenex in the room. But I, I, but I think uh, I mean I know your uh, your capacities as a um, as a psychotherapist and and as just as a, a beautiful human being, you know, broadly, you know, a, a broad and wide ranging, as you say, that sort of created this niche. I, I would just like to put it more that the niche has found you, uh, <laughs> that there was, there was a great need because um, uh, th there's, there's nuances in each different social, uh, social group uh, yeah. and those, and, and the nature of the way they function. And this is uh, something that was, Having a, a great deal of, well, ignorance in one sense, which is what we also talk about in all kinds of prejudice. Right. Uh, uh, right. As, as, as we know, Jane, um, Jane Elliott talks about that. Our problem is not prejudice, it's ignorance. Mm -hmm. and, the other, and the other one is, is just, uh, uh, I don't know, just, to, well, I, I'd like to leave you to explain it to us, but there's sort of a like, it's all okay for you now. Uh, Thank you for bringing that up. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Yeah. So um, a lot of studies, new studies are showing that medical providers and mental health providers are not getting enough training with the LGBTQ population. And they think they do. They think they know all that they need to know. And in fact, they do not. And that is how I start my workshops, showing them the statistics of this number. And it's pretty scary. And the other thing that's interesting is that whenever I present, frequently my workshops are on the last slot, the last day of a conference, yeah. and I get a very low turnout. And so conference invitees, it's all about the metrics of the speaker. And because my topic 
is something that is not of interest to people, even though it should be, I don't get a huge turnout. And as a result, I don't get a slot that's bigger. And what this speaks to is homophobia in our culture. And men in particular, physicians, psychotherapists, educators, uh, are slightly afraid of this topic and don't show up for trainings. Um, and then frequently there's a small group of women who, w women who come in who are working with gay men and want to know the ins and outs of things. But what people frequently say is, isn't everything all better now? Aren't gay men accepted more? The answer is yes. Gay men are accepted in a way that it's never happened before. And that's incredibly exciting. But gay boys are still growing up in secret, in a lot of pain, fearful of coming out, struggling with their families, frequently depending on their cultural group and their ethnicity and their race. They're being raised in cultures that are not supporting them. Sometimes they're in physical danger of their lives. So it's still a struggle. And I'm, I'm thrilled to see how things are moving ahead and how more gay men are accepted. And as a result, gay men can live in the mainstream in various places, but everyone still has their struggle and their process to go through. And frequently they will lie to their doctors or not tell their therapists about their sexual life because they're too ashamed. And the reason why my career has been successful as a gay male therapist is that gay men would come see me as early as the early 80s, um, knowing that I was gay and they could talk about whatever they wanted. So uh, it's all very interesting. Mm. Mm. Yeah, both Richard and I, you, we come out of um, sort of the arts and entertainment world um, where yeah. gay men, you know, have been very much, you know, an accepted part of the establishment, I guess, for, for, yeah. for many generations. And um, yeah. I would have thought that in the world of psychotherapy, um, that uh, there wouldn't have been um, such a, a, a negative bias, but I'm hearing something different from you. Yeah, I, I think that if you ask people if they're prejudiced, they don't say yes until recently with Black Lives Matter. So if you ask people if they understand gay men and they're accepting towards gay men or the LGBTQ population, they would say, of course I am. Um, when in fact, as you kind of look a little bit deeper, it's uh, an ignorance and a lack of education that people are dealing with, which is why getting education is so important. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's, there's a difference between acceptance, which I think is, it, it, I think there is a great deal more acceptance, and having a sensitive appreciation. Yes. Uh, and, yes. And, and it is, it is interesting. I mean, the, what Matt says, you know, coming from the entertainment world, I mean, the majority of males that I yeah. knew were, yeah. so it would have been 60 or 70% of the population, which was excellent. I mean, I think I went into the theatre to get girls because uh, <laughs> the, 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 there were lots of girls there and most of the guys were gay, yeah. you know. It was, you were it was all set. You might but, have been hit on, on a, by a couple guys too, I would guess. Oh, no, constantly. Constantly, yeah. yeah, but but it was lovely. I remember a lovely, uh, lovely lad, and he would always uh, bump up to me at parties, and he'd say, "Oh, have you turned yet?" And I'd say, "You know, it doesn't work like that." And he'd say, "Oh dear," and yeah. you know, we'd have a lovely chat and um, uh, and 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 have a lot of fun and games. Yeah, and I, and I think what is really interesting, and I'll just share this with you and everybody, that I had a a, a, a beautiful friend. And uh, it was gay. And I was spending a lot of time doing a lot of things. There was business. We were doing theatre stuff. We had a project going on. And the relationship was developing um, uh, in, a, in a very uh, heartfelt uh, way, as long as, as well as in a business way. And I do remember the, uh, the, uh, an evening and we had dinner. We were talking about bits and pieces. And if I had a sexual orientation towards a male, then I would have had a, 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 a sexual engagement uh, With or a sensual yeah. engagement on that day. Yeah. There literally wasn't. Uh, right. there, there literally wasn't. And he was a, uh, he was a very lovely person and, and, and there, was, there was no difficulty. But, but you was, know what's incredible? It was a, it was a good that, experience. Hmm. And you were giving him a good experience. And one of the reasons why I've connected with you always, Richard, is that you're 
face and your smile is so warm and welcoming. <laughs> and not everyone is like that. And gay men who experience other men who welcome them in in such an open way actually receive healing from these interactions. So my guess is that you were giving your friend way more than you even realized. Mm. That's well, that's very very nice to hear. It was a yeah uh, yeah yeah. But yeah. but I think the best thing in there is that I was able to test my own. Yeah. Understand. Yeah. I was able to understand that it was uh, that that your sexuality is a just a very natural uh, uh, and 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 unquestionable sort of uh, element yeah. in your life. Yeah. 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 Sorry, Matt. I... Yeah. No. No. You're right, uh, Rick. Uh, can I appeal to the trainer in you? Yes. And and I'm I'm wondering it, it might be a a tall order, but are we able to get get some tips um, for the practicing psychotherapist? Yeah. Um, you know, from your experience and your knowledge, yes. Um, that we can we can sort of take away um, from yes. today's conversation. Absolutely. The very most important point is that as a clinician you are sincere and welcoming with your gay male clients because we, I'm saying we as the gay male client, have experienced bias in the world. And when we go to your offices, we are going to be extra careful with the assumption that you're not gonna understand us, that we can't be ourselves, and that we have to conceal things in our lives that we've concealed everywhere else. And if you are able to show a sincere, generous, accepting stance, which is coming from the heart, you are going to win your clients over and the success of treatment will be just that. So one of the premises of my training is that when people come to you for a particular problem and you're working on that issue with them, that's great but there's a whole issue going on behind the scenes, which is the acceptance that you are giving them, which is giving them a greater level of healing in a much larger, much more profound way. And it's been interesting. Um, I've been a gay male therapist for 35 years, sitting in an office with my door closed and no one sees what I do. It's very safe. And then suddenly my first book came out, Unwrapped, and I'm suddenly on the teaching circuit, and I'm at book signing parties, and I can no longer hide behind the closed door. Suddenly I'm in the public meeting new people. I'm the expert talking about things, and it's frightening for me, especially at the beginning, because who am I? I've been hiding my whole life. Suddenly I'm in the limelight. So it was an interesting lesson for me to appreciate not only did I have something to offer people, but I couldn't hide anymore. Um, and so that's, you want to welcome your clients. The relationship okay. is so profound. There's, there's something interesting in what you're saying there, because uh, it's, it's very exciting. Matt and I have been asked by Norton to write a, a book on the, the science of psychotherapy. So, oh, so we're, we're going into all kinds of areas like genetics and, and uh, uh, you know, gut brain axis and all kinds of really interesting bits and pieces. And one of the things I've been looking at is this uh, big talk about the heart and the, the yes. sense of the heart. And that beautiful thing you yes. said there, you know, from the, the heart. And one of the comments, I've, and I've just written that chapter, is uh, that we talk about the heart. And I know some people talk about the heart having emotions and intelligence and wisdom. It doesn't. Um, it, the brain has that. that that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a cognitive thing. Yeah. Uh, but what it does is it has a sense of what is naturally good, mm -hmm. what is naturally well. And yes. we've got this thing called heart rate variability, where the body goes into a state of being saying, this is a good place to be. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really interesting. And what I wrote down, as you were saying, is that there's a natural wellness state uh, when we have engagement with the other. Mm. Yes. yes. And, and when we have concern and distrust of the other, then our heart rate variability changes and various mm. other things happen in the heart. And the heart brain sends this message to our mm. thinking brain and our thinking brain goes, I don't feel good. Mm -hmm. 
And so that's that thing. So in there, in that sincere and welcoming, that thing, that thing, be accepting, the, it gives you the opportunity to say, wow, why aren't I accepting of mm. the other uh, who's not hurting, you know, when I'm not in that's danger right. and so on mm. and so forth? Yeah. Yeah. So what are the dangers that people that you find uh, in your research before you go on to the next bit of um, therapeutic stuff, uh, what are the dangers that people uh, tend to say they feel or that they are told that they are presenting? Yeah. So you're talking about from the patient perspective, correct? I just want to yeah. make sure I'm saying. Yes, from the patient perspective. Oh. They come saying, yeah. people think I'm dangerous. Why, yeah. why do they think I'm going to, you know, uh, uh, right. what are the sorts of things that people tend to um, uh, convey or, or, or fear of someone who's the gay? Big, the biggest thing is just not being understood and not being accepted. Yeah. And um, for a boy who grows up being criticized by his community or beat up, by his father or beat up by his classmates because he was effeminate, he goes into the world not feeling safe. And frequently uh, clients who have gone into therapy and haven't felt accepted, or as I mentioned earlier, um, clients that go to see a medical doctor that, and they don't feel accepted by the doctor, again, the theme is acceptance, they end up leaving off the most important parts of themselves and they don't receive the care that ultimately they deserve and that they should be getting. So they're bringing the world is a dangerous place along with them. Um, interesting that when I frequently meet a client for the first time, I read their body language, you know, in just a flash and I get a sense of their comfort or their discomfort. Some people can't look at me. Some people look at me and smile. Some people are rigid in their posture and you can tell that they've been holding tension in their body their entire lives. And sometimes I think my role is to help them shift that state into something softer, more gentle, more easy. And sometimes I do that just through the interactions that I have with people. And sometimes I lead them through mindfulness exercises or hypnosis exercises to recognize that they can find a soft spot inside of themselves that they don't believe they have. Gay men have learned not to utilize any strength inside of themselves, and they don't believe that they have the capacity for self-soothing. So when I'm able to do a mindfulness exercise with a client and he learns that he has something inside of himself that he can rely on, it's pretty magical. It's really, really profound. Um, so I don't know if I fully answered your question. No, that's beautiful. That's, be that's lovely and beautiful. And I'm, it's interesting, Matt, we just had the other day one of our authors writing that he was criticized, and uh, he's not gay, he's, you know, he's funny, but he was criticized for describing a boy, uh, and I think it was a boy's face, as beautiful. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that was that was an interesting thing, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm, mm, yeah. Sorry, can I? You, you just mentioned, um, you know, uh, you, you've come from a Ericksonian um, foundation, yes. right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, a, a word about how that plays into oh, your, it's your wonderful. Yeah. So, my training actually is psychodynamic um, and psychoanalytic, which is very distant and in my opinion shaming mm -hmm. and so again i i started my career behind closed doors except that i had a personality always i always use humor i always used myself what i'm speaking like now is exactly what i'm like in my sessions but i couldn't let anyone know it um, and then I got into the Ericksonian world of psychotherapy, a world that is filled with creativity, expression, um, synchronicity, and I was struck that I found a home for myself that allowed me to be who I am without even having to try. And as I've um, kind of honed in on these skills even more, my clinical acumen and my practice has grown tremendously. When I started doing hypnosis with gay men, no one left therapy. 
I thought it would be a short-term stint doing hypnosis. Everyone stayed forever because it was touching something deep inside of them. So I love the fact that with Ericksonian work, we can kind of attune ourselves to the sensibility of the people that we're working with and find a way of connecting based on that, based on their own sensibility. And that creates amazing success in therapy. And you don't have to be a gay therapist with a gay client to do that. Uh, that's the good news. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. everybody, to some extent, is coming to a session with some uh, diminishment in their sense of acceptance, in their sure. sense of feeling whole, and the yeah. sense of, of feeling held. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what we talk about in trauma therapy. The, yeah. the first thing to do is to, to try and create the space and then hold the space as what I call it, as, as the movement from the, the disintegrating sort of mindset into a therapeutic mindset. Yeah. So that, that's sort of the, the, the next question. And I know we might be going off sort of a lovely sequence you have in the way you describe things. But that thing, that thing of enabling, uh, that, enabling that strength, bringing up that, that wholeness in, yeah. in a client, how uh, difficult has it been? And how difficult is it? Uh, uh, sort of a bit of a question, is there a, a shift, but are individuals still expressing great yeah. difficulty in finding that? So I, I think we get to have fun as clinicians. And if we allow ourselves to have fun, we can create a connection with our clients that's going to make the work really profound and powerful. And I'm on Cape Cod right now where I have a home office and I've had a home office for 25 years and I have a garden, I have a car, I have a dog that gets loose, I have a water view from my house. So there's all these topics of conversation that we can relate about even before they walk in the door. And that's growing a strength in the relationship and uh, promoting a bond between us that works really well. And so my psychoanalytic supervisors would have said to me that I was acting boundaryless by having these conversations or that I was engaging in a transgression in, in the therapy, whereas in the Ericksonian world, what I'm doing, but I'm also enjoying myself, is creating a context for relating, which ultimately is empowering a client to be able to experience a state inside of themselves that's a positive state that's ready to make change because something good is happening inside. So that just excites me to no end. Um, then there's the whole issue of humor, something that Richard doesn't know anything about. Um, <laughs> just apologies. Humor goes a long way in psychotherapy. And frequently I can make a very important point with humor and someone will be able to receive it in a way that they wouldn't if I weren't doing it with some kind of humor. One of my, my areas of interest is masculinity and working with men and how we can welcome men into treatment to get them motivated to want to stay, but also to want to change, which means working on vulnerabilities, which we've all as men been taught not to be. And so it's just really interesting to me that the way we're gonna do it is not by shaming people into feeling like they're dumb jerks, but instead to welcome them based on their own sensibilities to find the way in. And that's how we get to vulnerability. Right. Um, a, a few points there, I think, you know, bringing people into your own space with a home office is a very different dynamic, isn't it, to sort well, of a, an is. office in town. And, and so yeah. coming into your own space, it's uh, uh, like you say, not, not only uh, are there, you know, topics of conversation because of what's going around, but bringing someone into your space is uh, yeah, a very uh, intimate uh, sort of dynamic that's going on there. I've had many nightmares where my clients have come in and I'm like naked on the couch or I have dirty laundry in my office and I'm out of sorts. <laughs> All those fun things. Uh, look, I, I know two good therapists you can. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 there was a lovely thing that um, uh, uh, also another one of our writers, Matt, said Ken Beno, uh, in oh, a yeah. lovely article. And he said there's. The, what he talks about is is find uh, to be delighted in yourself, mm. and then for the other 
uh, is to be delighted in their delight. Ah, mm, and so true. And this is what I'm seeing, uh, you, I, I'm hearing in you, is first of all, you, you build them and create a situation where they feel delightful in themselves. And then yeah. they bask and uh, bask, is that the, yeah. but they, yeah. they, they feel that warmth of your delight in Absolutely. them being. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's so satisfying. Mm. Rick, I've got another question about, um, so gay clients, when they're looking for a therapist, do you think yeah. that there is a preconceived bias, whether they, they think that they're going to be more accepted by a male or a female therapist? If you could speak to that. Great question. Um, most gay men are afraid to work with men. Okay. Unless they know that they're gay, because they mm -hmm. assume that they're not going to be understood. And I frequently mention at trainings that a gay man a gay male client who works with a straight male therapist has the best opportunity for healing that there is. Right. Um, but it means taking risk and some won't be willing to do it. Um, I think it's also true that a gay man that works with a straight woman also has the potential for healing um, based on the acceptance that I was talking about earlier. But frequently gay men want to work with another gay male because there's no explanations needed about certain experiences or certain aspects of the gay community. And even though that's in fact true, it's also a little more safe. Right. Um, and sometimes there's the issue of competition between two gay men and who's the better a gay person. <laughs> um, a gay some, person. Yeah. Sometimes people are threatened by me yeah. because I have an urban look to the clothes that I wear and they think that I won't care about them or that I'm gonna treat them horribly like other gay men. Um, okay. Sometimes gay male clients are resentful that I'm thin um, and that, that I'm not gonna understand their struggle if they struggle with body issues and weight. Um, the whole thing is just very interesting. Right. Hmm. Yeah, I was wondering too, uh, I mean, obviously your work is in America predominantly. Yeah. Uh, do you have any sort of uh, uh, thoughts or, or uh, insights into uh, other countries? Are there other, on an international level, have you sort of done any work there at all? The, the work that I've done internationally is through the mental health community and, and engaging in workshops and trainings and conferences. And what I've found is that there are some countries that are incredibly progressive and accepting. And then there are other countries who are just way, way, way behind. And mm -hmm. I am always thrilled to be able to uh, create a presence and ignite uh, an energy or a fire under medical providers and clinicians. Um, the other thing that I'm working on, um, hopefully very soon, is establishing a larger YouTube presence so that I can get followers from all over the world. And one of my dreams is to have a support group for gay men that I lead maybe once a month or every two weeks that wouldn't be psychotherapy because I can't do that based on licensing requirements, but I could offer my expertise in a support group for gay men, gay men all over the world. And um, I think it would be a, a really rich, exciting experience. What I find as I teach and also with gay sons and mothers, as I present that I'm making connections with people all over the world and they are so appreciative of the experience that I bring, the fact that I'm out, the expertise that I have, it's really exciting. Well, you'll be, you'll be pleased this podcast was certainly, we're, we're doing our best to expand ourselves all over the world as well. Right. So we, we've got a quite, although we do have quite a lot of people in America, but yeah. um, uh, we've just had a couple of, uh, of our wonderful friends from Italy doing some wow. things. Great. Uh, you know, we've yeah. got a great uh, uh, psychiatrist that we talk to every now and again in, in Alexandria in Egypt, which is uh, fantastic. So all, so all these things are, are, are really important. And, and I think just reminding uh, from the Ericksonian point of view, Erickson said the purpose of effective uh, of the therapist is to to shift the responsibility of, of effective therapy back to the client. Mm -hmm. So um, so even when you're just doing uh, uh, presence, bringing people together, um, and in fact, probably the less therapy you do uh, uh, can even be beneficial because it, uh, it 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 enhances the client. I think that 
that you know yeah we must see what we can do to help with that because that yeah. if, if there's anything we can do because well, uh, that'd be love great to talk about that i yeah. lead groups i do three groups in my private practice two in boston one on cape cod and you get people in a group together and their ability to help each other is so profound and so exciting yeah yeah now, one thing, we're, we're probably sort of getting around the wind-up uh, time issue. Oh, and I so want to, I wanna, yeah, damn, that's because everyone's finished their job or their commute. <laughs> we always talk about that before. But the, um, uh, the thing, Rick, the, with this video, with this, uh, the, 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 the program, uh, The um, uh, Gay Sons and Mothers, yes. now, is that accessible uh, to people or how, how do they access that? What's the, the process um, there? Thank you. So please follow us, follow us. Yeah. Uh, we have a website, gaysonsandmothers.org, gaysonsandmothers.org. We have an Instagram page called Gay Sons and Mothers, all one word. And we have a Facebook page called Gay Sons and Mothers. So we're out there. And it's so exciting. I've been interviewing people falling in love with mothers and sons and hearing incredible stories and painful stories. And it, it transcends beyond being gay because everyone relates to stories revolving acceptance, rejection, coming together. I mean, it's just, it's so profound. And, and I'm, I'm just thinking I should just jump on Facebook and uh, straight people welcome in the, the Facebook group. Absolutely, the more the merrier, please join us. Brilliant. I'm always trying to increase our following yeah. Uh, and so please, whoever is listening to this, please look us up on social media. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm joining straight up as soon as, okay. as we finish. Beautiful. Yeah. Rick, Rick, give us one more takeaway before we leave. Oh, my God. A takeaway. <laughs> uh, not, not one not takeaway <laughs> is, is <laughs> right. The takeaway would be if you can help a gay male client find a, a comfortable place in his body in a psychotherapy session, then you're giving him a gift that he has access to within himself that he can go back to over and over and over again. That would be a takeaway. Okay, that is awesome. Beautiful. Rick Miller, thank you so much for joining us here on the Science thank of Therapy Podcast. Thank you, And I'll see you next time I'm allowed to travel. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. You know. laughs> okay, thanks Rick. We'll catch Thanks. you later. Bye-bye.